Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I've been asked to speak for about 20 minutes. The work I'm, I'm going to talk about, the research I'm going to talk about, has actually been published in book form uh, through the Chartered Accountants Ireland. It's called Charity Accounting and Reporting at a Time of Change. You know, if you want to buy a book, you know, you know they're uh, available from Chartered Accountants Ireland. And we're, so we're talking about some of that work, but obviously not all. Uh, I can say in 20 minutes is, it covers what it will um, it deals with, and and really what we're what we're talking about, I suppose, is good regulation and good good accounting and good reporting is vital to the health and growth of the, the sector. What, why that seems almost quite incidental, or maybe slightly boring, and, and it's not, but it, it's actually critical uh, to the sector. It can help the development and growth, and if it's not done well, it can damage the charity and damage the sector as a whole. And that's really what we're trying to say. And we're trying to look over time at what's been happening and the importance of appropriate regulation and the need for discipline and accounting and reporting. And we're trying to relate that to Northern Ireland and, and speak into the situation uh, here. We've got a, a fairly standard sort of structure. I won't delay there. And let me talk a little bit about the size. Now, the size is a bit contentious. We're not actually sure how big the charity sector is in Northern Ireland, but we have some estimates that, whether you realise it or not, in the UK as a whole there are about 200,000 registered charities. There are a number that are exempt or uh, accepted from registration in England and Wales, but about 200,000. They have a, an, an annual income of about £80 billion. Pounds. Um, and about Apart from that, the income, about 40%, we know from some research in England, about 40% of the adult population volunteer at some stage during the year, and that's not actually captured in income or any, anything like that. So their, their, their impact is much greater. In Northern Ireland, um, I didn't say about 6,000, and we may have 6,000 kind of registered. We probably think they're somewhere between seven and 11 and a, a half thousand, which is a fairly... <laughs> gives a, a, a kind of fair bit of a scope. Um, in, for example, some of these organisations, if you talk about England and Wales, you're talking about Save the, the Children Fund, which has a, an annual income of 905 million last year, or Cancer Research, 680 million last year, or National Trust, 522 million. So these are big, big organisations. But the charity sector is made up of a, lo a lot of of very small organisations and a few very big organisations. So it's, it's a kind of a mixture. In the Northern Ireland, with, the charities tend to be smaller, but they're still fairly substantial. Action Mental Health with 6.4 million, Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke, 4.1 million, Cancer Focused Northern Ireland, 3.8 million, the Action on Substances, 1.8 million. These are the kind of income figures we're talking about. And in terms of regula regulators, well, the England and Wales have had regulators since 1853. Scotland have had one called OSCAR, the Office for Scottish Charity Re Regulation, since 2003. And in Northern Ireland, it's, the regulator was established in 2009, really active from about 2011. In the south of Ireland, um, they've only had an, uh, in, uh, an independent authority really from October 2014, although the Charities Act 2009 in the, in the uh, uh, South kind of triggered the, the process, but it's been very slow, and they're, they're uh, significantly behind us in what, in what they're doing. So, let's, so it's a big sector. It's a big sector. Let me talk about some, some of the problems that we face, and I'll just put them all up. The charity, is the charity sector is changing, or perhaps more correctly, it's being changed by the, uh, by the external challenges that it faces. And some of those challenges are triggered by uh, the financial crisis. You know, there's pressure on funding, and really since 2008, 2009, the, the, the amount of public funding available to charities has, uh, has, has reduced somewhat. Um, so we've had problems there. And many charities receive significant proportions of the funding from the public purse. Overall, on average, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of total stature, uh, charitable funding comes from, the, comes from the public sector. And, and so we see, a, 
we see a problem where there's, a, there's been a financial crisis, we've got a period of austerity, especially in social welfare programs that are being cut back, and, and charities are trying to, to take the slack. So we've got a period where people don't have much money, but the demands on charities are increasing. So we have, I know the charity finance group in, the, uh, in GB talked about the perfect storm. They're trying to do more uh, with less. And then we've got pressures for government in a period of brought about partly by the financial crisis that uh, many governments have been trying to offload or kind of um, commission services that were previously um, supplied by the public sector. They're, they're trying to encourage the charity sector to get involved. So we've got a sector that is massively changing. Now let's look at what the sector is meant to be about. Our common expectations for, of charities are that they do good and they be good. You know, they do good, they, they create positive change, they do things that society values, and they be good. They, they, they spend wisely, they act ethically. So you've got, you know, you have to do good and you have to be good. And when the expectations hold, Stakeholders, people like donors, funders, the public sector, the, the, the public at large, continue to put trust in the charities. When these things don't hold, trust is lost and damage results. And damage you know, can be fairly significant damage. And we, we talk about trust. Trust is the belief in the reliability of, uh, of something or someone or some organisation. And what we're, what we're arguing in... in today and, and in our book and in other work we've done, that um, trust is absolutely essential for ensuring the health and growth of the, of the sector. We need to build trust and we can do that through how we discharge accountability, how we interact with the stakeholders who, who, uh, who we come into contact with. Let me, let me just pick up on that. And we'll talk about some of the scandals that have happened, because there have been scandals, and I could go on at length here. Um, so scandals, however isolated, really inflict damage. They inflict damage on the charity, they inflict damage on the charitable sector, and they inflict damage on society at large. I mean, we get issues like the kids company. I don't know if you're very high profile in 2015 brought about by very poor management, and particularly very poor financial management, and the action, or possibly inaction, or a mix of both, by government, and the involvement of government directly in, in, uh, in funding charities or releasing funds to charities where it was highly questionable. So we, we have that. We have, if you know, the Olive Cook affair. Maybe not aware of the Olive Cook affair, but she's uh, the much publicised a 92-year-old poppy seller from the British Legion who, uh, who, who committed suicide. And, uh, and it was found out that she had believed to have received almost 3,000 charity mailings in a single year. You know, and that brought all sorts of problems for, in, in terms of fundraising and, and questions uh, how charities raise funds. And then I've, I've, I've avoided using Northern Ireland examples here. And then excessive salaries, big issue, big, big issue, excessive salaries. In the uh, south of Ireland, they've had a few scandals in that, you know, with the uh, central remedial clinic and rehab, um, really about uh, whether they would disclose what their, uh, what their chief executives and key personnel were being paid and the contracts that they may, those key personnel were involved in. I mean, that had real damage in the south of Ireland. For example, the Iris Hospice Foundation, which was not in any way involved in this, they estimate, they, they claim that because of the scandals in the south regarding uh, excessive pay, that resulted, this was in 2015, they, they, they said it resulted in a 50% drop in donations to the hospices Christmas appeal. In other words, people, not that they'd done anything, but because this was happening, people were very wary of getting involved with charities or giving to charities. So we kind of, the damage that this could, can, can do, so how can we avoid that? And what we're really saying is good, good accounting and reporting under, 
underpins good accountability. Now, accountability is much more than accounting and reporting, even if we're accountants and we'd like to think it's, it's all, all about accounting. It's not. Accountability is much, much wider than that. But good accounting and reporting underpins it, and that supports the building of trust, and that helps the health of the sector. Poor accounting and reporting undermines accountability, damages trust, and damages the sector. So what we're talking about in this sort of era, we're talking about transparency. Charities have to be transparent. They have to be open. They need to communicate. They need to be accountable. And accountability is about being answerable, being answerable about giving an account and holding someone to account. And, you know, when we talk about accountability, two key questions often crop up and we have to answer is, to whom is an organisation or to whom is a charity accountable? And often we think of donors, funders, the public at large. And for what are they accountable? You know, so to whom are they accountable and for what are, are, are they accountable? And really what we're saying here, good accounting and reporting underpins good accountability and supports the building of trust. And let me talk about accountability, types of accountability. Well, there's accountability, we can look at it in many ways. And what's convenient is we can talk about financial accountability um, relating to ensuring that the funds are used properly in the manner authorised. They're properly accounted for. That's why financial accounting requ requirements, following best practice, uh, clear rules, uh, are important. That's why auditing is important. Good quality financial statements based on best practice and audited by someone outside are important in giving uh, a, an account. They give confidence, even if the person receiving them hasn't a clue what they mean. You know, because it, you don't have to understand it, but you just need to know it's there. And there's someone looking at it and someone banging them if, it, if it's not right. That's important. Um, but more important than that, much more important than that, is performance accountability. In other words, what do we do? Financial accountability is like only ever to be secondary to performance ac accountability. Um, and what we mean, we're talking about you know, what, what, do you, what impact do you make? What outputs do you achieve? What are you actually doing? Tell us stories. If I donate to save the children, um, I, yes, I'm concerned that the money is properly accounted for and used for the purposes for which it was given. Yes, I am. But I'm really concerned about its impact on children. In disaster relief, who was helped? In what ways? What impact did it have? In educational pro projects, uh, how many children were educated? Uh, to what level? What was their impact on their life chances as a result of that? Development projects, how many? How their impact on the social and economic well-being in an area? And what I want, I want... I want numbers and stories. I mean, uh, we often trot out this, there should be no numbers without stories, and there should be no stories without numbers. In other words, we're telling a story of the charity, and we're engaging with those stakeholders outside of the charity by telling that story. And what we, we're arguing, I mean, it does seem strange coming from accountants, is that's where it's really important. Financial accountability is, a, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And what's really important is performance accountability. Now, speaking into this, we have the statement of recommended practice. Now, again, I don't know how many, you know, I wave my, I get no, I get no royalties from this, so don't buy this. It's downloadable free from the Charity Commission website. But uh, that's the latest uh, SORP SORPs. What are SORPs are, and this is quite an interesting story, they're recommendations on accounting. Uh, practice for specialised industries or sectors. The charities are viewed as a, as a sector. They don't replace legal and regulatory requirements. They supplement and interpret them. And, and really, in Northern Ireland, if you're, a, uh, if you're a company charity, you have to comply with the SORP since the beginning of 2016, I believe. And if you're a non-company charity, if you're above 250,000 uh, income, uh, you have to comply with the SORP as well. If you're lower than that, you, probably, you may want to comply with the SORP because it gives a certain credibility to what you're, you're, you're doing. So that would, but the, the SORP's a, a kind of, what it consists of is it tells you how you could do your financial statements, all the techie stuff. I see Kieran there, Kieran, that's the stuff you love. And so it gives you all the techie stuff. 
but it also gives you an, another aspect, the trustees and your report, the story bit. Tell us about what you're doing. Tell us your charity story. Tell us how you're governed. Tell, tell us how you operate. And we're saying that bit is particularly important. And if you want to discharge accountability, you need to think about that. And in thinking about that, it may change the way you do the charity, the way you work in the charity, which is, which is fairly uh, critical. Um, let me, sorry, I was going to say something more there. Yeah, let me, the, what, what has happened is the first charity sort came out in 1988, which seems a long time ago, um, but it's been refreshed in, two, in 1995, 2000, 2005, and lastly in 2015, or if you like to say 2014, we were debating that on the way over. It, it applied from the for, uh, to England and Wales for all accounting periods beginning 1st of January 2015. But, all right, that's maybe fairly dry. Let me try and explain why this was important and why it is important. Because before 1988, charity accounting was awful and it was dreadful and it could have done major damage to what was going on. Let me give one example. The, the, most of the work that uh, led to the... Uh, publication of the first statement of recommended practice was done by a couple of uh, researchers, Peter Bird and Peter Morgan Jones, published in 1981. And then people woke up and realized how bad things were. I can't go into the detail, but let me give you one detail. They looked at some very contentious accounting um, practice. And one they picked up was, was to do with legacies. Now, legacies are where money is given in a will. Now, the difference between a legacy and a donation is this. It de de is determined by the state of health of the person giving the money. A legacy, they're not too good. They're kind of horizontal. A donation, they're usually vertical. That's the only difference of the, where the, that's a, their state of health. So, you say, is that a big thing? Let me say that in cancer, cancer research received £169 million in legacies last year. 38% of its fundraised income. What about this one? The life, I don't know if you give to lifeboats. The RNLI received £113 million in legacies last year, that 66% uh, of their fundraised income. The RSPCA received £64 million, 59%. Legacies are mega for many charities. Not all charities, but they're mega. Now, what did charities do in the 80s? Well, a lot of them didn't put them to income. They didn't consider, they put them what we call for an accountant, we'd say they, they went to capital. In other words, they didn't touch the income statement or alternatively a bit, a little bit was dripped in. What did that mean? That mean that the, um, a source of funds was not recorded as income at all. Why did they do that? They did that to show that they were in need of funds so people would give more. It was scandalous. And yet the auditors did nothing about it, and it was common practice. So that's how bad things were, and that's why we have what, what we have. So, and, and the thinking was that if you continue that, you just undermine confidence. That breaks as a big scandal, and, no, and everyone stops giving to charities, or a lot of the giving dries up. So you need to get this right so that you can protect, that you can protect the sector. Right, let me talk about what our research says. I've, I've now got 20 minutes. I, no, no, I know. Just joking. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I realise, I realise, I work with Marianne. Uh, so what we did, uh, or part of what we did, was we looked at the reporting of 25 large UK charities and uh, um, 25 uh, large Republic of Ireland charities. We actually did a mix. We looked at a lot of documents. We also went and interviewed people, I'm mainly talking about the uh, documents we looked at today. And we looked at various categories because the charity sector is broken up into various categories. So we picked our sample to do a match sample as a good researcher between the South and the, uh, the, re uh, and the UK. And um, what we looked at, every ch each charity published an annual report or trustees annual report. And a number of them also publish a an annual review 
I mean, annual reports are fairly formal documents, part of the sort requirement. Annual reviews are voluntary forms of reporting. They for focus more on what the charity is doing. They have simplified figures. They are written in less formal language. They include stories, photographs, and things like that. They, they're often a, a, a document through which charities engage more with their, their donors, you know, where they, a donor might be a bit concerned about picking up a, a trustee's annual report, they may be uh, keener to look at an annual review. And what we were looking at is if performance accountability is where it's at, that really is the accountability that's important. How are they doing? And what we did was we, we really developed a checklist and we said, well, what would good performance accountability look like? And we had a number of rules and we said, well, you would expect them to say something about their objectives, something about their, the activities they've been, something about their inputs, you know, where they spent their money and uh, what staff they use in different ways, something about their outputs, something about their impacts, which is kind of long term uh, rather than outputs more immediate something about their efficiency and something about their effectiveness, something about what they're going to do in the future, and something about what lessons they've learned. Now, we're, what we were saying, I suppose crudely, is this is kind of a model of what we would expect. you. If you were engaging with performance accountability, this is what you should do. And what did we find out? Well, they didn't do it very well. And in fact... <laughs> You know, if you look at, and, and it's a fairly crude measure in some ways, but if you look at the nine things that we were looking at, and we had rules to identify them, about disclosure rates on average about 50%. But they were much, they were, well, they were significantly stronger in the UK charities than the Republic of Ireland charities. So um, that was a, a, a concern. I suppose a concern as well is that if annual reviews were the thing that really captures people's imaginations. Very few, certainly in the Republic of Ireland, produce such documents. So they, there, there wasn't much engagement there. And in those documents, there's a lot of detail in the, in the book, there was very little information about effectiveness and efficiency. And what we mean by effectiveness is, well, tell us what you've been seeking to do during the year and tell us what you did do. Kind of give us that story. Tell us what, what you set out to do and what you actually achieved. And then efficiency, if you're doing, if you're, you know, for effectiveness, if you, if you plan to dig a hundred wells, how many did you, did, did you dig? If you plan to educate 500 students, how many <coughs> students did you educate? If you helped, if you plan to feed 40,000 people, well, how many did you, you feed? That's effectiveness. Now, efficiency is more to do with how much it costs to dig a well or how much it costs to conduct an operation, things like that. And we're saying there was hardly any or there's very little information regarding that. And we know from other work that, that donors and uh, stakeholders are very interested in that. And, and really what we were arguing, and it, these shortcomings, not being, not being willing or being able to tell the performance story, to tell the charity's so, uh, story through their annual reports, through their annual report, uh, reviews, really undermined their accountability. In other words, we were looking for stories and numbers, and they, those weren't there, or to a large extent, those, those aren't are there. And we're, we're arguing that such shortcomings undermine the trust and confidence in the sector and damage reputation and ultimately impact on funding flows. And we know that from other work. Once there's a scandal, funding flows dry up or at least uh, start um, flowing at a, a, a lesser degree. And we're really arguing, we're making a persuasive case for greater endeavor for the development and use of more substantial performance measurement and reporting by charities. Not that it's just a formal process of reporting, but thinking about performance measurement, performance management, kind of uh, um, becomes part of the fabric of running a charity, that we start um, really uh, co concentrating on those issues. Let's, try and, let's try, and, try and link it to what's happening in Northern Ireland and what should be happening. What we're seeing is that there are greater push for performance reporting in the UK compared to the Republic. Um, and that... In the, because there's a greater push, there's, there's much more engagement for UK charities 
in, in such discussions. Now, Northern Ireland sits a bit in the middle. I know we're in the UK. I know, I'm not trying. But, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Charity Commission England and Wales have been there since 1853. We've had our Charity Commission for kind of five or six years, but not very long. And uh, the, the South have had r real problems. What we may find, and I think what we're finding, when there have, where there is this regulation and there's more mandatory requirements and there's more push from a regulator, albeit all this needs to be proportionate, and I'm fully aware of that, but a mandatory reporting s system increases or encourages the likelihood of such disclosure. And, and kind of what we're arguing as CCNI here has a, has a key role in requiring or encouraging performance accountability and performance uh, focused by Northern Ireland charities. And we're saying that that is vital to support con continued health and um, growth of the Northern Ireland uh, sector. But a real concern, I suppose, in periods of austerity, um, I'm, we've got a... Uh, we, we're running a course, uh, a short conference at Queen's next Wednesday. There are flyers at the back if you want to come along. But Andrew Hind, who was the first chief executive of the uh, Charity Commission in England and Wales, is coming to speak uh, at it as well. I know he used to be the head of the Fundraising Standards Board when the Olive Cook affair broke. Um, but uh, he's, he, I was speaking with him at a, a, an event in England um, a few weeks ago. And he was really concerned that the Charity Commission in Wales were going to get an absolute hammering in the, the latest round uh, of, of uh, budget cuts. And that would, would concern me, especially in Northern Ireland, that the, Northern, the Charity Commission in Northern Ireland is a very small organisation doing a mammoth amount of work and, an, um, and, and, and some very important work. And, you know, we, you know, so I think there, you, we need to be looking at how we resource that financially and I suppose legislatively as well, but maybe that's a bit in abeyance uh, at the, the present time. But, uh, you know, that's a concern. If we, want, if, we, if we value a regulator and we value this stuff and we value the sector, we need to take this seriously. And I suppose, lastly, just some chari charity-specific guidance should be developed or supported uh, um, by those concerned with the administration of the, uh, and control of the sector to really support charities. Because it's very hard, if you're a small charity trying to do this, it's very hard to do it without um, some guidance. And have I stuck to time? Probably not. But uh, there we go. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you.